Hello and welcome to Baidu's IAS. Before we begin the analysis, I would like to inform you that from today, we shall be sharing a separate PDF in the description box below that contains all the practice questions of the day. This will help you to consolidate all the practice questions in one place and you can use them for your revision. So with this, let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. On the occasion of World Food Day that marked the 75th anniversary of the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Prime Minister has spoken about the issue of food security and its connection with MSP or minimum support prices. The Prime Minister has reiterated that MSP is key to India's food security and that the government is committed to procurement and improving the functioning of APMCs. This reassurance from the Prime Minister with regard to MSP comes at a time when there are massive protests being organized by farmers across the country against the three newly introduced farm legislations. A few weeks ago, we had discussed in detail the three new farm legislations that was introduced by the government as a part of its efforts to carry out agricultural reforms. These new farm laws have raised concerns that the government might be trying to do away with minimum support prices and this might place the farmers at the mercy of the private players and the corporates who henceforth can directly procure from the farmers because now the farmers have been allowed to sell their produce outside the APMC mandis. So based on these concerns, farmer organizations around the country have been carrying out protests against the government. And during his speech, the Prime Minister has tried to reassure the farmers by stating that MSP is key to India's food security. He has indicated that the government has no intention to do away with MSP and the latest agricultural reforms have been introduced with the intention of modernizing the APMC mandis and with the intention of removing the middlemen from the procurement process who are currently exploiting the farmers. The Prime Minister has said that the latest reforms allows the farmers to sell their produce outside of the APMC mandis and going forward they could sell their produce directly in the market especially to private players and corporates thereby allowing small and marginal farmers to substantially increase their income. So in this context let us talk about MSP in complete detail and understand why the latest agricultural reforms have raised a concern that MSP might be abolished by the government in the future. See MSP is basically the minimum price at which the government would have promised to procure the agricultural produce from the farmers during the Karif and Rabi season. Since MSP is the minimum support price, it basically sets the floor price for the agricultural crop and it ensures remunerative earnings for the farmer. Under the current procurement system, farmers are free to sell their produce to government procurement agencies or as well as in the open market through the APMC yards. But if the market prices fall below the MSP that has been announced by the government before the cropping season, in such a case, government procurement agencies such as the Food Corporation of India, NAFED, etc., they step in and they protect the farmers from the price fall by procuring the crops at the predetermined MSP prices. So such procurement by the government at MSP prices will not only protect the interests of the farmers and ensure remunerative earning for them, but it also safeguards the interests of the consumer because it will help in stabilizing the demand supply equation and help tackle price volatility in the market. So the MSP policy serves multiple objectives and it was introduced in the mid 1960s by the government when the Green Revolution was initiated at a time when the country was battling severe food shortages. See, the MSP-based procurement policy traces back its origin to the food rationing system that was introduced by the British during the Second World War. Then in the 1960s, when India was facing food shortages, the government was looking to improve agricultural productivity and shore up its food reserves. So this is when the government introduced the Green Revolution by promoting the cultivation of high yield variety of crops along with the usage of modern inputs such as fertilizers, pesticides, etc. But adopting these modern methods of farming would increase the input cost for the farmer and hence there was a need to reassure the farmers that their investments would generate remunerative earnings. So the government was looking at boosting agricultural productivity through the green revolution and at the same time it was looking to build up its food reserves so that the massive food shortages seen in the mid-1960s could be prevented and this could provide for price stability in the market. 
So it was with this intention that the minimum support price system was introduced in the mid-1960s. And for formulating this policy, the union government had set up a committee in 1964. Initially, the committee recommended a minimum support price structure for essential crops such as rice and wheat. Later, this policy was expanded to cover cereals and other variety of crops as well. Then in 1965, the government established a permanent body known as the Agricultural Prices Commission to recommend the MSP prices for various crops which could be later fixed by the government. This body was later renamed in 1985 as the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices or the CACP and today it is this institution which recommends the MSP for various crops before the cropping season and these recommendations are considered by the government that is by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs and it happens to be the final decision making authority as far as fixing MSP prices are concerned. So please remember that the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices is only a recommending authority. It doesn't have the powers to fix MSP, it only provides recommendations. Based on these recommendations, the government can either accept them or reject them. And finally, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs takes a final call and fixes the MSP for variety of crops before each cropping season. Now the question is, how is the MSP price calculated and fixed? See, for recommending the MSP prices, the CACP takes a number of factors into account. This includes the input cost, demand and supply, price trends in the domestic and international market and the possible implications of the price on the consumer. So like this, a variety of factors are taken into consideration by the CACP and appropriate MSP prices are recommended to the government. These recommendations are provided every year before each cropping season and the CACP recommends MSP prices for five groups of commodities. So in total, the CACP recommends MSP prices for around 23 crops under these various categories. After considering these recommendations of the CACP, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs takes a final decision and announces the MSP before the cropping season. Now let's understand what purpose does MSP serve. As we already discussed, it ensures remunerative earnings to the farmer, it protects the interest of the consumer by dealing with price fluctuations and by stabilizing the demand supply equation which in turn helps in keeping the prices at reasonable levels. So basically, when the market conditions are unfavorable for the farmers to sell their produce in the open market, MSP guarantees them a minimum price at which government agencies will procure the produce from the farmer. It can also be used as a policy tool by the government to encourage a certain type of cropping pattern by incentivizing the farmers to grow certain kind of crops which are in short supply. Because when a higher MSP is announced for a certain crop which is in short supply, then farmers would be motivated and incentivized to grow those crops and this will help stabilize the demand supply equation and also to deal with higher prices for those crops which are in short supply. But however, the MSP policy also has a number of drawbacks as well. Farmers across the country have faced numerous problems while selling their produce at MSP prices. This is mainly because of delays in procurement by the government procurement agencies and also because of exploitation by the middlemen and the commission agents who exploit the farmers and this defeats the very purpose of MSP. The complications in the supply chain and in the procurement process allows middlemen to play a greater role and this has led farmers to not enjoy the full benefits of the MSP prices. Along with this, available data shows that very few farmers in the country are able to benefit from the MSP policy. According to the Shant Kumar Committee report of 2015, only 6% of Indian farmers are able to sell their produce at MSP prices. And this shows that the policy is supporting only a few categories of farmers in India. Various studies have clearly established that a majority of Indian farmers have never benefited from the MSP policy and even governments have been quite hesitant to increase the MSP prices because of its added financial cost. However, the MSP policy has become more of a political tool and an appeasement policy to turn the farmers in the rural areas into a vote bank for the political parties before the elections. It is also believed that the one-sided nature of MSP policies has affected crop diversification in the country. Because usually, MSP is focused on certain crops such as rice and wheat, whereas other essential crops such as pulses, edible oils, etc. they have been largely ignored. 
So this has incentivized farmers to only cultivate a certain category of crops, whereas other essential items have been ignored, leading to shortfall of these items and thereby higher prices of these items in the market. But however, despite all these drawbacks, the MSP policy provided an assurance to the farmers and it guaranteed them a remunerative income and hence the MSP policy has come to be seen as a safety net for the farmers. But however, the latest farm bills introduced by the government has raised concerns about the continuation of MSP. Because see, MSP is just an administrative policy of the government. It doesn't have any legal backing in the current form and it does not find any mention in any law as of now. So currently, it is just an executive policy and there is no law that mandates its implementation and enforcement. In fact, the CACP in itself is not a statutory body and it is just an attached office of the Ministry of Agriculture. The CACP only recommends the MSP prices and it's up to the government whether to accept these recommendations or not. However, most governments accept the recommendations and they even procure the crops at MSP prices, especially that of wheat, paddy and a few other crops, mainly because of political compulsion. And the government also regularly implements and enforces the MSP policy, mainly to ensure adequate supply for the public distribution system. Because under the National Food Security Act, the government is obligated to accord the legal right to food to families below the poverty line. So to fulfill these requirements and to ensure price stability in the market, the government becomes obligated to enforce the MSP policy. And it also implements the policy mainly because of political compulsion because MSP, as we discussed, has become a political tool. Sugarcane is one crop whose MSP enjoys some sort of legal backing because the MSP given to sugarcane is officially or legally known as the FRP or the Fair and Remunerative Price. This price is governed and regulated by the Sugarcane Control Order of 1966. But for other crops, there are no such legal backing and it is left to the administrative discretion of the government to enforce these policies. So in order to guarantee the farmers the right to sell at MSP prices, the CACP had recommended a separate legislation which would accord this right as a legal right to the farmers. But however, the government did not accept these recommendations. And now, the three farm bills that have been introduced by the government as a part of its agricultural reforms has raised concerns amongst farmers and farmer organizations that MSP might be abolished in the future. Because see, the Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Bill 2020 allows the farmers to sell their produce outside of APMC Mondays, and this basically allows them to bypass the middlemen and directly sell to the private players and corporates. Then the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill allows the farmers to enter into a contract farming agreement with corporate players who would have agreed to procure the crops at predetermined prices. Then the third bill, the Essential Commodities Amendment Bill, declassifies a number of essential items. And as you can see, none of the bills contain any reference to MSP. So as a result, farmers are upset that MSP may never receive any sort of legal backing and the right to sell crops at MSP prices may never be accorded to farmers as a legal right. So this lack of legal safeguard has made farmers believe that the government might slowly withdraw the MSP policy in the future and this would place the farmers at the mercy of the private corporates because in the absence of a MSP, there is no safety net for the farmers. Farmer organizations believe now that farmers are being allowed to sell outside the APMC mandis, this would subject them to exploitation by the private corporate players because of their larger bargaining power. Their concern is that small and marginal farmers would become highly vulnerable to price exploitation by the big corporates. And this is one of the primary reasons behind the massive protests that we have been seeing in the country over the last few weeks. So it is in this context that the Prime Minister has tried to reassure the farmers and the farmer organizations by stating that MSP is key to India's food security and the government is committed to procure and improve the functioning of APMCs. So the Prime Minister has used the occasion of the World Food Day to send out this message to the farmers and reassure them about these concerns regarding MSP. Now let's take up the next article. The Supreme Court has constituted a one-man committee to monitor and tackle stubble burning in the Punjab Haryana region. See, stubble burning is the practice of burning the crop residue 
that is left behind after the harvest of crops. This crop residue is referred to as a stubble and farmers, especially in Punjab and Haryana, they prefer to set the stubble on fire because for them, this happens to be the easiest and most economical way of clearing the agricultural field and preparing it for the next cropping season. But this practice of burning the stubble releases a lot of particulate matter into the air and it is known to cause severe air pollution and smog conditions in the Delhi NCR region, especially in the winter season. So the practice of stubble burning in neighboring Punjab and Haryana is said to be one of the biggest contributing factors for the severe air pollution and dense smog conditions seen in the Delhi NCR region during the winter season. So to tackle the threat of winter air pollution in the Delhi NCR region, the Supreme Court has already constituted the EPCA or the Environment Pollution Prevention and Control Authority which is responsible for implementing the Graded Response Action Plan that we discussed just a few days ago. In addition to this, the Supreme Court has now constituted a one-man committee under the leadership of former Supreme Court Judge Madan B. Lokur to personally monitor and prevent instances of stubble burning in neighboring Punjab and Haryana. The Supreme Court has said that the functioning of this one-man committee shall not interfere with the powers of the EPCA and retired Judge Madan B. Lokur has been specifically chosen by the Supreme Court because of his expertise in dealing with environmental matters especially with regard to air pollution in the Delhi NCR region. To help Madan B. Lokur implement this mandate laid out by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has asked the NCC, the NSS and the Bharat Scouts and Guides to provide cadets and volunteers to the one-man committee so that they could personally monitor agricultural fires in the Punjab Haryana region and take suitable action against them. Now let's take up an article from page number 4. A new Bodo group known as the All India Bodo People's National League for Bodoland Statehood has said that it opposes the recently signed Third Bodo Accord and it has stated that it is going to revive the Bodoland Statehood movement. So first let's understand the background to the Bodoland Statehood movement. See the Bodos are an ethnic group found in the northwestern part of Assam in the Kokrajar, Chirang, Baksa and Udalguri districts. These Bodo inhabited areas have always felt a disconnect with the other ethnic groups of Assam and some of them had even resisted integration with the Indian Union and hence in the 1960s they began a movement for self-rule in the Bodo inhabited areas. In 1967 the Bodos organized a protest known as the Udaya Chilster and through this movement they started demanding self-rule in the Bodo inhabited areas. This political movement flourished through the 1970s and by 1980s it turned into a violent insurgent movement because this was a period when multiple insurgent outfits were thriving in the northeastern states of India. So in 1986 the first Bodo insurgent outfit known as Bodo Security Force was established and as violence increased the government of India and the government of Assam entered into negotiations with the Bodo groups and as a result the first Bodo Accord was signed in 1993. Through this Bodo Accord, the government agreed to provide greater autonomy to the Bodo inhabited areas and as a result, the Bodoland Autonomous Council was established. But this accord was not accepted by several Bodo outfits and as a result, the Bodo movement split into several factions and the insurgent outfit Bodo Security Force split into various factions and renamed itself as the NDFB or the National Democratic Front of Bodoland in 1994. This outfit, that is the NDFB, would go on to become a major notorious separatist outfit in the Northeast. And right now its demand was not just separate statehood or self-rule, but it was seeking outright independence from India. So through the 1990s, all the way up till 2020, various factions of the NDFB carried out numerous terror attacks in the Northeastern states, especially in Assam. And it had even managed to establish multiple safe havens in neighboring countries such as Bangladesh and Bhutan. Reportedly, NDFP was receiving covert support from China and as well as from Pakistan. As a result of this split within the Bodo groups, intense rivalry started emerging amongst the Bodo outfits and as a result in 1996, a rival outfit was set up known as the Bodo Liberation Tiger Force or the Bodo Liberation Tigers which was opposed to the NDFP. So during the 1990s, there was intense rivalry between these Bodo outfits as well. 
the Indian government capitalized on this rivalry and after effective counter-insurgency operations and after the insurgent movement was slightly weakened, in 2003, the second Bodo Accord was signed with the BLT or the Bodo Liberation Tigers. As a result of this accord, the BLTF or the BLT surrendered and the Bodo Autonomous Council, which covered these four districts, was transformed into the Bodo Land Territorial Council. With this transformation, the 2003 Bodo Accord granted more powers and more autonomy to the Bodo inhabited areas and this was widely welcomed by several Bodo outfits. But the NDFB refused to accept this accord and it continued to wage a war against the Indian government. Recently, in January 2020, a historic Bodo Accord was again signed between the Indian government and the NDFB and several other Bodo organizations and this has come to be known as the Third Bodo Accord. The government of India hailed this as a historic accord because the NDFB and several factions of it surrendered and in return the government has committed to devolve more powers to the Bodo inhabited areas and provide more funds for development of the region. Under the new accord, the Bodoland Territorial Council is being renamed and reorganized as the Bodoland Territorial Region and very soon fresh elections are supposed to be held to this autonomous region. But however, a few provisions of the new accord are being opposed by some new outfits and a new group known as the All India Bodo People's National League for Bodoland Statehood has opposed the new peace accord and it has said that it is going to revive the Bodoland Statehood movement. The reason for its opposition is that this group believes that the new peace accord could lead to the reduction of the area of the Bodo inhabited areas which enjoy autonomous powers. Because see, under the new accord, the Bodoland Territorial Council has been empowered to exclude certain BTR villages which are already a part of the autonomous region if they have more than 50% non-Bodo population. Similarly, the council has been given the powers to include neighboring villages which are outside of the Bodo autonomous region if they have more than 50% Bodo population. So the intention of the government is to exclude a few autonomous villages which have less Bodo population and include those neighboring villages which have a higher Bodo population that currently do not enjoy the benefits and powers of greater autonomy. So this means that the Bodoland Territorial Council, which has been renamed as the Bodoland Territorial Region by the Third Peace Accord, will witness a possible change in its geographical demarcation and there could be a possible reduction in its area. So this provision of the Third Bodo Peace Accord which might lead to a possible reduction in the area of the autonomous region has not been accepted by this new outfit and hence it has opposed the third peace accord which was recently signed and it has declared its intention to revive the Bodo land statehood movement. Now let's take up an article from page number 9 that evaluates the global hunger index that was published yesterday. See the global hunger index happens to be one of the most important global indices and its findings are very important for both prelims and as well as for mains. This index was brought out in 2006 by the International Food Policy Research Institute along with a Germany-based NGO known as Welthunger Hilfe. In 2007, another NGO based out of Ireland known as Concern Worldwide also joined the index. But since 2018, the IFPRI has quit the index and currently it is being published just by these two NGOs. This global index is seen as one of the most important indicators of the status of hunger, nutrition and food security in the world. So understanding India's performance on this index is going to be very important for both prelims and mains. In this year's global hunger index, India has performed very poorly and it has been ranked at the 94th position out of 107 countries. Honestly, this is a shameful position for India to hold because even last year, India was ranked at the 102nd position out of 117 countries. In the 2020 report, India's score is 27.2 and even countries such as Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar and even Pakistan have been ranked higher than India. The most shocking thing for India is that in the South Asia, Southeast Asia region, only three countries have been ranked below India. That includes North Korea, Afghanistan and Timor-Leste. Honestly, this is a very embarrassing position for India to hold and it clearly reflects the status of hunger, nutrition and food security in the country. 
As we discussed yesterday, hunger and malnutrition are directly linked to poverty and it not only leads to a number of diseases but it also affects economic growth and development. See, if you look at the Global Hunger Index, it is computed on the basis of four parameters. This includes undernourishment, child wasting, child stunting and child mortality. Based on a country's performance with regard to these four indicators, a country is classified under the low, moderate or serious category. So in this context, it is very important to understand what is child wasting and child stunting. See, child wasting refers to low weight for height. So if a child, especially under 5 years, is of a lower than normal weight for his or her height, then such a child is considered as a wasted child. Then if a child has lower than normal height for their respective age, then they are considered as stunted. And India performs very poorly on both the accounts. According to the Global Hunger Index of 2020, India has the highest prevalence of wasted children under 5 years. This clearly shows that there is acute undernutrition in the country and this is directly contributing to child wasting and child stunting. Especially with regard to child wasting, India's performance has deteriorated considerably over the last one decade. Because if you look at the report of 2010 and 2014, India's child wasting performance was ranked at 15.1%. Whereas for the 2015-19 period, India's performance has deteriorated to 17.3%. So over the last one decade, child wasting in India has clearly increased. But however, with regard to child stunting, India's performance has improved over the decades, even though it continues to be ranked in the poorest category. In the year 2000, child stunting was at 54% in India and this has reduced to less than 35% as of now. Then another positive for India is that child mortality rate has improved and it currently stands at just 3.7%. So as far as these four indicators are concerned, India's performance with regard to child stunting and child mortality has improved, but India's performance with regard to undernourishment and child wasting has deteriorated. The report shows that nearly 14% of India's population is not receiving sufficient calorie intake and this extent of hunger and malnutrition and undernutrition is bound to lead to more diseases and poor economic growth thereby pushing millions of people further into poverty. And as we discussed yesterday, hunger and poverty, they form a vicious cycle. The report also makes a very important observation with regard to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The report points out that millions of people around the world and as well as in India could be pushed further into poverty and hunger as a result of the pandemic. Because the pandemic has disrupted livelihoods and it has pushed a number of people into poverty and this is bound to increase hunger and malnutrition. The report notes that even without taking the pandemic into consideration, the world was not on track to achieve the sustainable development goal number two of zero hunger by 2030. The report observes that a number of countries are bound to miss this target because of weak food systems, weak food supply chains and poor policies. And upon this, the challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic is just going to aggravate the problem further. Now coming to the editorial section on page number 6, we have an editorial that deals with IMF's report that is the World Economic Outlook. Kindly remember the name of this report published by the IMF because it is going to be very important for prelims. So the IMF has brought out its World Economic Outlook which highlights the current status of the global economy and the challenges being faced by it. The report is dominated by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns on the global economy and it clearly points out that the global economy is going to contract along with most of the national economies around the world. So considering this declining global growth, IMF calls upon all the member countries to take into account the impact of the pandemic and the lockdowns on livelihoods and economic development. The IMF points out that in an interconnected globalized world, no country can consider itself to be insulated economically and hence countries need to abandon conservative closed policies and instead they need to embrace open economic policies and promote international cooperation so that global economic recovery can be accelerated. Next we have another column on page number 6 written by Manjeev Singh Puri who happens to be India's former ambassador 
and Deputy Permanent Representative of India to the United Nations. In this column, the writer makes a case for UN reforms and he calls for renewed multilateralism and he is calling upon India to exploit the declining global image of China and push for institutional changes and structural reforms at multilateral institutions so that under renewed multilateralism, countries like India can start playing a greater role at the UN and other organizations. This is a discussion that we had just yesterday, so I don't think we need to discuss this again, but I would request you to go through this column once. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. Where is the giant meter wave radio telescope observatory located? Is it in Alaska, United States or Pune, India or Hawaii, United States or the Atacama Desert in Shelly? The correct answer is option B. It is located in Pune, India. See the giant meter wave radio telescope observatory is located near Pune and it is an array of 30 fully steerable parabolic radio telescopes that can carry out astronomical observations at meter wavelengths. This radio telescope is operated by the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, which is a part of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research based out of Mumbai. This giant radio telescope was conceived, conceptualized and built under the leadership of Govind Swaroop, who is considered as the father of radio astronomy in India. When this giant telescope was completed in the 1990s, it was the world's largest interferometric array telescope offering a baseline of up to 25 kilometers. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 5, researchers have made use of data from the GMRT telescope and they have discovered that star formation activity is declining in the Milky Way galaxy. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following traditional toy manufacturing locations enjoy the GI tag or the geographical indication tag? Chanpatna, Nirmal, Etikopaka and Kondapalli. All the four are correct. Option D is the right answer. See, Chanpatna is located in Karnataka on the outskirts of Bengaluru. Nirmal is located in Telangana. And Etikopa and Kondapalli are located in Andhra Pradesh. All the four towns are known for their traditional toy manufacturing industry. And all the four have been accorded with the GI tag. This question has been asked because we have a dedicated column on page number 7 that evaluates the traditional toy manufacturing industry in India. See, recently, the Prime Minister, during his Man Ki Baat address, he spoke about the achievements of India's traditional toy manufacturing locations such as Chanpatna, Nirmal, Etti Kopaka and Kondapalli. So in this context, this column evaluates the challenges being faced by India's traditional toy manufacturing industry because the Prime Minister said that these centres have the potential to become a global hub for toy manufacturing. But the reality is that artisans in these centres they are facing numerous challenges because of high GST, lack of innovation and lack of funds, inadequate training and especially the influx of cheaper imports from China. Now let's take up the next question. When a court grants a stay order in a civil or criminal case, it stays valid until a period of 6 months. Option B is the right answer. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 10, the Supreme Court has clarified that any stay order issued by a court in a civil or criminal case shall remain valid only for a period of six months. After this period, the stay order will automatically expire and this will allow the trial to be resumed again. Now let's take up the next question. The Absheron Peninsula is a part of which country? The correct answer is option C, Azerbaijan. See currently, Azerbaijan and Armenia are in news because of their ongoing conflict in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. As you can see in this map, Azerbaijan shares a boundary with the Caspian Sea and the small peninsula that you can see over here is nothing but the Absheron Peninsula where the capital of Azerbaijan, Baku, is located. In the ongoing conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, it is considered that Russia might back Armenia whereas other regional powers such as Turkey are seen to be backing Azerbaijan. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? The Collective Security Treaty Organization or CSTO is a military alliance led by China. The members include China and all the Central Asian countries. Both the statements are incorrect and option D is the right answer. Because the CSTO is led by Russia and the members include a few Central Asian countries and a few Eurasian countries. See currently the member states of CSTO include Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia and Tajikistan. 
Afghanistan and Serbia, they enjoy the observer status and former members include Azerbaijan, Georgia and Uzbekistan. These two questions have been asked because according to this article on page number 13, Russia has planned a series of military exercises in the Caspian Sea even as the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia is going on in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Armenia, which happens to be a member of the CSTO that is led by Russia, expects Russia to support its cause in its conflict against Azerbaijan. But until now, Russia has officially stayed neutral with regard to this conflict. But this military exercise in the Caspian Sea planned by Russia is being held near the Abshurun Peninsula, which is a part of Azerbaijan, and hence it has raised concerns that Russia might intervene in this conflict. Now let's take up the next question. The oil-rich Reed Bank Island is found in the South China Sea. Option C is the right answer. Please look at this map. This is where Reed Bank Island is located. It is considered to be a part of the exclusive economic zone of Philippines. But however, this is contested by China. This is a part of the Scarborough Shoal dispute between China and Philippines. See, in 2016, the Permanent Court of Arbitration had ruled that Philippines enjoys complete control over the Scarborough Shoal and it had defined the exclusive economic zone of Philippines as per the provisions of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But however, China had refused to accept this award of the PCA and it continues to challenge Philippines' claims over Reed Bank and other islands located as a part of the Scarborough Shoal. In this map, you can also see the parasol islands that are disputed between China and Vietnam. You can also see the Spratly group of islands that are disputed between China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Philippines and Taiwan. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 13, Philippines is planning to exploit the oil and gas potential of Reed Bank and other areas around the Scarborough Shoal and it has also said that if China threatens its oil exploration activities, then Philippines would take any measure and stand up to Chinese aggression. Now let's take up the next question. The New START Treaty signed between US and Russia deals with nuclear arms reduction. Option B is the right answer. START stands for Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. It mandates both US and Russia to reduce their nuclear weapon stockpile. And according to this article on page number 13, President Putin is looking to extend the New START Treaty because this treaty which was signed in 2010 is all set to expire in 2020 and hence Russia is looking to extend the treaty and Putin expects US to cooperate as well. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. The Food and Agriculture Organization accords the status of globally important agricultural heritage system to traditional agricultural systems. What is the overall goal of this initiative? to provide modern technology, training in modern farming methods and financial support to local communities of identified GIAHS so as to greatly enhance their agricultural productivity, to identify and safeguard eco-friendly traditional farm practices and their associated landscapers, agricultural biodiversity and knowledge systems of the local communities, to provide GI status to all the varieties of agricultural produce in such identified GIAHS. Amongst the given statements, the first and the third statement are incorrect, so option B is the right answer, two only. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, illustrate how minimum support prices or MSP plays a key role in ensuring food security in the country. The second question, evaluate India's performance on the Global Hunger Index 2020. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.